<laughs> thanks for joining us again for chatting with NDGS Paleo. Um, for anyone who's new, I am uh, Dr. Clint Boyd, <clears throat> and I manage the Paleo program for the North Dakota Geological Survey. Um, also with us today from the Geological Survey is Becky Barnes, our lab manager, and Jeff Person, our collections manager. Um, they'll pop in as needed through today. Uh, today, we have another guest speaker who's joining us. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Darren Paniak. Uh, Darren got his PhD from the University of California, Riverside, and he is currently an associate professor at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, he also kind of unofficially serves as curator of the vertebrate paleontology collections at the Museum of Geology there. Uh, on the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology campus. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration with Darren and his group since they're just right next door in South Dakota. We've got an active project going on right now on some Oligocene, Miocene, about 25 to 30 million year old fossils uh, from South Dakota and comparing them to the North Dakota record. And I've previously done a paper with Dakota on the dinosaur Dakotadon lakotaensis, which I think was a pretty great project from down there in the Black Hills. Um, so Darren today, though, is not going to talk to us about dinosaurs. He is going to talk to us about camels and the secret history of the, the fossil record of camels in North America, which a lot of people don't think about camels being here in North America, but they were actually quite prevalent here. So uh, with that, thank you for joining us today, Darren. We really appreciate your time, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you for having me, you guys. This is wonderful. This is a nice change of pace for me being locked in my office and recording uh, lectures and and uh, and not seeing the light of day for uh, hours and hours at a time. So this is this is a wonderful change. So let's see. I'm going to then share screen. So what I want to do today is tell everyone a little bit about fossil camels because fossil camels do not get a lot of attention. Uh, but they're actually really cool. So fossil camels are actually amazing animals. And I spent, I've spent a fair amount of my time uh, studying fossil camels. I've actually named two new, uh, two new camels. Uh, about uh, 10, 15 years ago, I named two new camels. So uh, camels are like really, really neat. And this slide, uh, starting the whole, the whole talk here, is a slide that's going to show some of the diversity here that you'll see of camels in the past. So here is the average sized human. You can see we have some amazing different types of camels. We've got our modern dromedary and uh, Bactrian camels here, but we'll talk a little bit about the diversity of camels that you, uh, that you see in the fossil record. And the take home message here is that camels have done a lot more throughout geologic history, throughout prehistoric time, than they have done, than, uh, than we see them doing today. They're doing a lot, a lot more. So first off, what is a camel? What are camels? Well, let's start with the definition that we have today. What are camels today? Well, today we recognize camels as occurring in two major groups. The first are the camels that we all sort of know and love. We have the dromedary and we have the Bactrian, the one hump versus the two humped forms. And one of the things I always like to tell people is you can always remember these two. You can always tell these people these two types apart because dromedaries have a D on their back and Bactrians have a B on their back. Mm -hmm. So that's an easy way to remember one hump versus two, dromedary versus, uh, versus Bactrian. The dromedaries, of course, live in uh, Africa and the Middle East. And the Bactrians live in Asia. And one of the things you'll see here is that the Bactrians are a little shaggier. They uh, uh, are a little bulkier. And that's because they tend to live in uh, colder, high desert, or even uh, uh, forested environments in, uh, in Central Asia, right? So again, not the typical sort of camel scenario that you'll see. Usually this is where you, uh, you see the, uh, the camels uh, um, this is usually what you think of when you think of camels or these dromedary camels out in the desert. Now, the other half that people are usually somewhat surprised about are llamas. Llamas are actually camels as well. And so down in South America, we have a whole different subset of camels uh, that migrated down there. So we've got things like the llama pictured here and the alpaca 
pictured here, these are the domestic forms of camels from South America. And the alpacas are generally a little furrier, a little fluffier. They, of course, have the wonderful alpaca uh, wool or fur that you see. And then there are two wild forms of llamas left uh, um, in South America today. We've got vicuñas and guanacos that are the wild forms that still roam free in the uh, Pampas down in South America. So these are the camels that we sort of know and love today are the camels that are Asiatic and the llamas that are typically South American. Now, taking this question a little bit further, what exactly is a camel? How do we define a camel, particularly as paleontologists? Because as paleontologists, all we have to deal with is the skeleton. And so what are some of the characteristic features? Well, here is a great classic drawing of a dromedary camel. And one of the things that we have to, uh, um, that we have to uh, um, focus on with camels are these bones right here. These are the hand bones and the foot bones, the metacarpals and the metatarsals. Camels are cloven hoofed animals. They have a split hoof. They're related to deer, cattle, giraffes, hippos, all that sort of thing. And they walk on two toes. And they basically walk on what will be our middle finger and our ring finger. Those are the two toes that they walk on. In most of these type of cloven hoofed animals, what happens is these bones, they lose all the other digits. So the thumb, the index finger, and the pinky, they're gone. And they, uh, um, they lose these, uh, these, these, these bones. And they fuse up these two hand bones into one solid unit. And then this would be the ring finger and the middle finger. Well, camels don't quite do this, all right? Camels fuse them up, but they retain this split at the very end. So what happens is their hand and foot bone ends up looking like a slingshot. So this would be the wrist out here, and this bone down, or this end down here where it splits is where these animals would be, uh, where, their, where their toes would be splaying out. Because of this, camels have a very splayed foot. And this has served them very well throughout history. They've been able to move within a wide array of environments. They've been able to move throughout a lot of terrain. And of course, today, camels are very good at moving through sand and loose dirt. And the llamas and guanacos are good at moving about in alpine conditions. And this is all because they have this very characteristic splay or split at the end of their hand and foot bones. And we see this split in all camels, all the way back to the very, very beginning. The oldest camels will have this split in their hand and foot bones in their metatarsals and metacarpals. And so this is one of the dead giveaways of a camel. The other thing we're often asked about camels is, well, did uh, prehistoric camels have humps? One of the things we're gonna find out is it's actually tough to tell because as you can see by this skeleton here, uh, there is uh, um, no indication of a hump via the, uh, the skeletal anatomy. There are some longer spines in these shoulder and trunk vertebrae, but these longer spines are there to secure tendons that help hold the long neck and skull up. The hump is all soft anatomy. And so we can't really tell if that hump was there in these older camels or not, because it's just not exhibited in the fossil anatomy. Now, one of the interesting things that Clint already alluded to about camels is that for most of their history, we today think of camels as either being native to the Middle East, North Africa, or to South America, but throughout the vast majority of their geologic history, camels were native to North America and only North America. Camels are a very, very ubiquitous and staple part of North American mammalian faunas. What, you say? Yes, camels have been a mainstay of North American fa faunas from about 40 million years ago until the end of the last ice age, about 11 million years ago. So what happened was 
camels evolved in North America. And the oldest camel appears in North America about 40 million years ago. And then camels diversified a great deal in North America throughout the next uh, 35, 40 million years. And in fact, we see a number of major diversifications of camels in North America, at least three times that camels really exploded into a diverse array of sizes and shapes and morphologies and whatnot. But then as we hit the end of the Miocene epoch, about 5 million years ago, North America gets connected with South America. And at about 5 million years ago, camels move south from North America to South America. And this is where then we, uh, uh, we get uh, um, our llamas, vicuñas, guanacos, and that sort of thing evolving down in South America. And then a little later, at the end of the last ice age, when Alaska was connected with Asia, this is when the ancestors of, of modern camels migrate to Asia. And so we get the Bactrian camel settling in Central Asia, and then we get the really intrepid camels out here moving to North Africa uh, and becoming the dromedaries. And so as a consequence, some of our oldest existing camels are going to be the camels that are down here in South America. And then the Bactrian camel is going to be a little bit older, have a little older history than the dromedary, which was the uh, sort of furthest to disperse in that sort of business. But for the most part, we can see a vast array of camels of different sizes and shapes occurring in North America. And for most of their history, camels occurred nowhere else except North America. It was not until very recently that camels uh, um, existed outside of North America. And so one of the reasons that I study camels was because when I was working on my doctoral research, I was examining fossils from the Mojave Desert. Uh, fossils from the Mojave Desert that were about 15 million years old and near a little town called Barstow. If anyone's familiar with the Mojave Desert, that's where I was working. I was working in Rainbow Basin out at Barstow. And this time period was the height of camel diversity in North America. There were upwards of 15 different kinds of camels in North America at that time period. And so what I'm gonna do is just sort of show you all some of the different types of camels that we have throughout history and some of the strange things that camels have done that are very quote unquote uncamel-like uh, throughout history. They don't become the camels that we know and love until very, very recently. And there were many, many different sizes and shapes of camels throughout North American history. So let's start by going all the way back to the beginning, all right? This is a camel that is very near and dear to our hearts here in South Dakota. This is Poebrotherium. Poebrotherium means grass-eating beast or grazing beast. You'll often see mammals having this suffix in their name of therium, that means beast. And so Poebrotherium is grass-eating beast and it lived from about 40 to 28 million years ago. And we find Poebrotherium pretty commonly in the badlands of North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Colorado. And this was the very first sam camel. This was a cat-sized camel that uh, um, lived, uh, um, lived in the Great Plains in the late Eocene and Oligocene epoch. And it's very, very common. Here is a skull of Poebrotherium, and uh, it looks very similar to the skulls of animals like deer or uh, other things that lived at the time. But Poebrotherium, even the oldest camel, still has that splayed or that slingshot metacarpal and metatarsal. It still has that present in its feet. So uh, we, uh, um, we can still recognize Poebrotherium as a camel even though it is very old and looks virtually nothing like the camels that we have today. It was only about cat sized, but it's a very, very common component of uh, um, faunas from places like the Big Badlands of South Dakota. So this is the earliest camel, the first known one. Then we jump ahead in time a little bit. 
So we can jump ahead and we'll begin with one of the first diversifications of camels that we see in North America. And this occurs at the beginning of the Miocene. So about 23 million years ago, we see Poebrotherium diversify into a number of different uh, uh, types of camels, all doing very, very different things. And one of the most interesting from this time period is this thing called Stenomylus. And Stenomylus means narrow tooth because it had very, very thin molars at the back of its mouth. Very, very tall, thin molars. And it had very tall, thin molars because it was living at a time where there was a lot of volcanic activity going on. And so volcanic activity was causing ash to be spewed up into the atmosphere. And this ash falls down on the plants. And so this poor animal had to be eating all of these plants that are covered in volcanic ash. Well, volcanic ash is basically uh, shredded glass. And so it's very, very tough on teeth. And so stenomylus had to evolve very, very tall teeth in order to keep them from getting worn down. Stenomylus is very common in Western Nebraska. And in particular, it's common at a very, very cool place called Agate Fossil Beds. Agate Fossil Beds is a uh, National Park Service unit that is just north of Scotts Bluff, and it records uh, deposits of life from this time period. And we get many, 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 many uh, skeletons of this animal, Stenomylus, at, uh, at Agate Fossil Beds. They were, these animals congregated in little herds. And then they died and were preserved as these herds in these river systems that were running through Western Nebraska at the time. So if you ever get the chance, check out Agate Fossil Beds. It's a very, very cool spot. So this is a gazelle camel. And it's called a gazelle camel because here it is compared with the Thompson's gazelle. Superficially, they look very, very similar. And they are about the same size. So Stenomylus was about the size of a, of a standard sized dog maybe a little bigger, but it had very long legs and was capable of running and probably leaping uh, great heights, just like modern uh, uh, Thompson's gazelle are today. So it's often referred to as the gazelle camel because it bears a striking resemblance to these, uh, these modern gazelles. And they were living in herds down in Western Nebraska, just like modern gazelle do today. So very, very common. We literally have hundreds of specimens of Stenomylus from Western Nebraska. Well, if we jump ahead another maybe eight to 10 million years, now we are dealing with the time period that I worked in for my dissertation. And there were a number of different, there were you know, a dozen different camels living at this time period. And we have camels that we're basically doing things that deer do today. We have camels that we're doing, you have these tiny, tiny little camels that we're doing things like musk deer or chevrotain are doing today. But one of the most interesting and common camels was this thing from 15 million years ago called Epicamelus. Epicamelus means tall camel. And this camel was basically doing 15 million years ago what a giraffe is doing today. This is an example of what we call convergent evolution. And this is an example of two different animals uh, evolving the same body type in order to achieve the same function. And in this case, that function is being able to reach leaves in tall trees. And so everything about Epicamelus was mimicking what we see in a giraffe. Very long legs and a very long neck with a very long skull that was able to reach in and eat, uh, and eat foliage off of these tall trees. Western North America at this time period was very similar to East Africa today. And so you had these giraffe camels roaming around eating plants, eating leaves from very, very tall trees. We find Epicamelus all over the Western United States, South Dakota, Nebraska, North Dakota, uh, all the way over to California, uh, the desert Southwest, the Pacific Northwest. So this was a very, very widespread camel. It got to be about 12 feet tall, almost as tall as modern giraffes, not quite, but almost as tall. 
And uh, um, again, a wonderful example of what we call convergent evolution or an animal uh, converging on a particular body plan, in this case, a giraffe, in order to suit a particular need, which is uh, um, uh, eating plants in tall trees. Well, if we jump ahead a little bit further, now we're at about eight to two million years ago, and we get this camel, which is pretty amazing. This is Titanotylopus, which means giant knobby foot. And you can think of this camel as basically uh, 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 being a, um, a regular camel, but really beefed out on steroids. It's just huge. It's a huge major giant camel. So Titanotylopus was the largest camel that ever lived. This is a skeleton of Titanotylopus from, I believe, the American Museum. And you can see it compared with the skeleton of a person. And so by this time, one of the things that we are seeing is that we can begin to see the relationship between these ancient camels and llamas versus camels. And I have a little camel up here because Titanotylopus was closely related to modern camels. Epicamelus was most closely related to llamas, hence the little llama up there. So this was a giant camel that lived in the Western United States and Mexico. We find it all over the United States and Mexico. And it was huge. This is the largest camel that ever lived. It's even bigger than Epicamelus. They were about the same height, but this was a much bigger, beefier, bulkier camel that was very, very common throughout the Western United States. And it lived until about the beginning of the Ice Ages. So it was roaming around Western North America at the beginning of the Ice Ages. So this is the largest camel that has ever lived in the history of the world. Here you can see an example of Titanotylopus compared to a six foot uh, modern human and it's compared to a modern dromedary or a single hump camel. Uh, so it's again two to three times bigger than a, uh, a modern camel. Now standing next to Titanotylopus in this drawing here is a picture of uh, uh, um, Camelops, Camelops hesternatus, which is the last camel that we'll discuss today. And Camelops is pretty cool because Camelops, which means camel face, existed from 2 million years ago to about 11,000 years ago. This was the last camel to be indigenous or native to North America. This was the last North American camel. And it survived right up until the end of the Ice Age. And in fact, we have camelops from all over the Western United States and Mexico. It's actually very common from the La Brea Tar Pits. So we know that camelops was getting stuck in the tar uh, the same way as, uh, as uh, um, all the other animals were getting stuck in the tar. And so camelops is the last North American camel. Again, about the same size as a modern dromedary. And one of the things we can see again is, again, based on its skeleton, it's tough for us to tell if these camels had a hump. We know modern camels, their hump is there to store fat to help them get through lean times, uh, lean times in the desert. But we don't know if these prehistoric camels needed these humps to get by. So it's tough for us to tell if these old camels had humps or not. Oftentimes they're reconstructed, they're depicted with, uh, uh, with uh, um, humps on their backs, but we don't really know if they had them at all. So this was the last native camel to North America, and it went extinct about 11,000 years ago. And camels were then extinct in North America. Oh, and as you can see, camelops is related to llamas, is related to modern llamas. So as you can see, camels, were then gone in North America until they made a very brief return to North America in the late 19th century. So in 1855, because the US Cavalry was all over the Western United States and conditions in the Western United States were very arid and very dry, um, someone proposed that maybe we should use camels in Western North America 
in order to get around and to uh, uh, ferry uh, uh, goods and mail and whatnot. So from 1855 to 1864, the U.S. Army actually had a Camel Corps in Western North America, and they brought uh, about 70 camels from the Middle East to Western North America, and there was a whole unit in the U.S. Cavalry that moved about with camels. Here's a photograph with a camel outside a post office in, I believe this is in Tejon, California, where the uh, camels were doing uh, their work for the U.S. Army. Now, these camels worked very well for this job. They, uh, um, they could handle the terrain very well, and they were very good pack animals. The big problem was that most of the soldiers in the army did not like them because camels are very ill-tempered. They are very, very ill-tempered animals. And they also didn't get along with the horses. The horses were actually scared of the camels. So the U.S. Army Camel Corps was disbanded in 1864. And the last wild camel left over from the uh, Camel Corps was seen wild in 1941. And we haven't seen uh, uh, camels since. So camels made a brief reappearance in North America. But unlike horses, they really didn't, uh, they really didn't take off uh, as well. So that is what I have for you. Very uh, uh, brief overview of some of the diversity of camels that we see in North America throughout the, uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, um, Western United States and throughout uh, history. And with that, I will be more than happy to take your questions. All right, I think I'm just gonna keep us in gallery view. It'd be kind of kind of fun this way. Okay, <laughs> so our first question would be, uh, you've pretty much already answered that, uh, but we can just review it again. Uh, are good. there bones in the hump of a camel? No, there's not. So there's not bones in the hump of a camel. Um, the, uh, the hump, is composed of fat. So the animal preferentially stores a special kind of fat in that hump that helps it get through uh, lean times. There's a lot of lean times in the desert where these modern camels uh, um, uh, don't get a chance to get food and water, that sort of business. And so, uh, um, no, there's no bones in the hump, which is why, again, we have a tough time telling if these old camels actually had humps because the skeletal anatomy doesn't really show us any bones in the hump. Um, they do have some elongate spines on the vertebrae between their shoulder blades, but those elongate spines are acting as an anchor, uh, to anchor all the tendons from that long neck and that big long skull at uh, the end of that neck. So those serve as more of an anchor for their neck and head rather than to help support the, uh, the, the hump on the back. So based off of their feet, uh, how closely are sheep related to camels? Camels and sheep are actually in the same major group. They're in this group called Artiodactyla, which basically means they're cloven hoof. They walk on basically these two, these two feet right here. Now, they are a little more distant related. For example, sheep are very closely related to things like cow or African antelope, uh, um, that sort of thing. Uh, camels are a little more distantly related and camels are a little more distantly related because uh, of how they process their food. All right. So sheep are what we call ruminants. They have a, 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 a complex system of stomachs that help them uh, digest their food. Uh, camels don't have this. They don't have quite as complex a digestive system, but based on their, uh, their split hoof, they are in the same major group of cloven hoofed animals, the group that includes deer, sheep, cattle, that sort of thing. But camels would actually be more closely related to things like pigs or uh, javelinas. They would be a little bit more closely related to them, maybe a little more closely related to something like a giraffe than to a sheep. Uh, back to their toes again. Uh, so yes. they had split toes. Did they have hooves like horses or, or like sheep or did they have something else? So they have kind of, as best as we can tell, uh, they did have, they have reduced hooves. Even modern uh, camels have, don't have like major big hooves like horses or cattle do. 
what they have are uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of reduced hooves out at the ends of their fingers. But because their toes are so splayed out, what they have are these big pads all around their feet. And these pads help them navigate in soft terrain. And modern camels can walk through the grass, uh, or excuse me, through the sand uh, um, and uh, um, get traction because of these big, large pads. Now, if we look back at the tracks of ancient camels, we can see that they actually had these pads really at least as far back as about 15 million years. So they were beginning to develop these pads about as far back as then. But the further back we go, we think that these camels were actually having a bit more hoof-like things, particularly with those like gazelle camels that were probably doing more running. Modern camels really get about by like kind of just walking slowly from point A to point B, conserving their energy. Uh, and so these pads work a lot better for that. But as we go further back in history, they probably had a bit more uh, hoof-like uh, toes just because they were doing a little bit more running and leaping and that sort of business. Can you go into a little bit more detail explaining the land bridges on how the animals would have gone from North America to Asia to Africa? Absolutely. So what happened first is North America was during warm periods, North America was isolated uh, from Asia and South America. And that's because sea level was high. Sea level was up. And so the animals were sort of locked in uh, to North America. But when times got cold, these giant glaciers began to extend from the north down to central North America. And these glaciers basically sucked up all the ocean water. So ocean levels dropped. And when the ocean levels dropped, that's when these land bridges began to form. And so the first one formed between North America and South America, basically through the Isthmus of Panama, about four, about, about you know, five to three million years ago. And this resulted in an event we call the Gabby, or the Great American Biotic Interchange. And so South America had been separated from North America for 30 million years. And so there were totally different kinds of animals that lived in North America and South America. Now, all of a sudden, they were connected up. So South America got camels, South America got horses, South America got dogs, South America got uh, elephants, mastodons, and mammoths, that sort of thing. And North America got porcupines, North America got possums, North America got uh, things like nutria and that sort of business. North America got giant ground sloths, North America got glyptodonts, or these giant uh, Volkswagen sized armadillos. Uh, and so, uh, um, and so these things were going back and forth. So this is when the North American llamas made their way South. Then at the end of the last ice age was when the land bridge, uh, formed between North America and, uh, uh Asia. And these Ice Age camels, like Titanotylopus and Camelops, were actually adapted to live in the cold. And so they were living way, way up north in Alaska and the tundra and whatnot. And when this land bridge formed, things like Camelops made their way across the land bridge over to Asia, and then they became the Bactrian camels of Central Asia first. And then these Bactrian camels migrated their way down to the, to the Middle East and became the one hump, the dromedary camels that we have today. So camels are actually a great example of what we call biogeography. And biogeography is how animals migrate and move to the areas they live at today, and hence how they evolve in response to the areas. We have a little bit of difference between Bactrian and Dromedary camels because Dromedary camels uh, 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 are, uh, um, are uh, um, uh, adapted to a more arid desert environment, whereas Bactrian camels are adapted to uh, uh, um, a little more temperate kind of uh, uh, seasonal environment. I know people get worried over here with our zoo. They look at our camels like, oh, it's cold outside. Aren't the camels freezing? It's like, yeah, do you see the layer of snow sitting on top of the camel? The camel's fine. They're doing fine. <laughs> Bactrian camels can handle yep. it. Mm -hmm. They're just fine. Yep. All right. So with Camelops and how young it is uh, and with the whole Ice Age thing, uh, have there ever been any like mummified or permafrost camelops found or anything that's not necessarily fossilized? Wow, good question. Um, 
As far as I know, I don't think so. I don't think that we've found any like permafrost camelops, which would be amazing. Um, you know, usually what we find uh, permafrosted are uh, things like, uh, um, you know, mammoths or horses or, or uh, uh, muskox, bison, that sort of thing. But I don't think we've found any, uh, any permafrost camels. Now, even though camelops was up there, way up in the tundra, it wasn't common. It wasn't a very, very common occurrence. So the chances of it getting preserved in permafrost are lower simply because there weren't that many of them. Uh, but I don't think we have any permafrost camels in North America. Um, I'd be interested to see if we got any out of Russia because there's so much more land area in Russia that, uh, um, that uh, the chances of you getting a, uh, you know, a preserved, a permafrost preserved camel would be a lot higher. Of course, over in Russia, they have permafrost everything. You know, they have permafrost lions, they have permafrost rhinos, you know, they've got a lot more than we do. So it'd be interesting to see if they ever got a permafrost camel, but I don't know of any. Uh, are there any skeletal differences between males and female camels? Oh, yes, there are. Yep, yep. And particularly if you look at uh, Bactrian and dromedary camels, the moder modern camels, um, the males have much more robust skulls and the jaws of camels are actually full of pointy teeth, all right? They've got their grinding molars in the back, but up front, they convert, uh, you know, all sort of mammals have the big canine, the big curved teeth uh, that you see in like dogs and cats and whatnot. Camels have those, but camels also convert their last incisor and their first premolar to a big uh, canine tooth as well, a big curved, sharp tooth. So they've got like one, two, three, four, five, six of these big canines. And the males are actually kind of nasty. They like nip and bite at each other and stuff with these giant, uh, these giant teeth. Camels are very ill-tempered. They are, they are <laughs> very, very ornery critters. And so the males have much bigger, uh, um, much bigger canines, much bigger teeth and much more robust skulls than the females do. This is exhibited to a certain degree with llamas, although it's not quite as, as obvious in llamas as it is with camels. And we can then even see this going back in time. We've got enough of, uh, enough skeletons of camelops that we can, uh, uh, we can, uh, um, uh, see some differences between the males and females and camelops. The further back we go in time, we don't have quite as many skeletons, so it gets a little more difficult to tell. How fast can a camel run? Oh boy, good question. Camels never really, modern camels never really run, I don't think. Camels are interesting. So the way they run is they pace. And what that means is they do one side versus the other, one side versus the other, one side versus the other. And they have employed this gait for at least 15 million years. We can tell by their tracks that for at least 15 million years, they've been pacing like this. It's the opposite of what a horse does where a horse kind of does this like that. Pacing is a very good gait for walking long distances. It's not a very good gait for running. So camels generally don't do much in the way of running. And I'm just kind of pulling these figures out of my head, but I'd wager that a camel is probably not going to do much more than say 15, 20 miles an hour. So they're probably capable of going faster if need be. But um, based on my experiences with camels, they're not running around. They're facing a predator and being ornery. So, um, but I would say, you know, topping out maybe 25 miles an hour. So during lean times, if the humps were made out of uh, fat content, would they grow or shrink? They do shrink. They do shrink. And in fact, one of the things you can see, particularly with Bactrian camels, because they have taller humps, during lean times, they'll actually start to kind of fold over a little bit because the, the fat is getting less dense. So, um, yeah, the fat is getting less dense. There's getting to be some cavities in there. And so, yeah, you can tell when a Bactrian isn't quite as well fed because those humps will kind of fold over. And they will shrink in the dromedaries as well, although the dromedaries have kind of a bigger... Uh, uh, 
uh, wider, more broad uh, uh, hump. So it's a little, le little more difficult to, to see that, but it's very obvious in Bactrian cameras. Would the humps have been similar to the, the large humps seen on modern bison? Um, a bit, yes, yeah. Um, the humps seen on bison now do have somewhat similar of a purpose. Um, they do store some fat in that hump, but it's not quite as extreme as what we see in camels. A lot of, a lot of the hump in the bison is also big, thick shoulder muscle mass that is helping the animal hold that big, that big head up and helping the animal run. But it is somewhat similar, yes. So back to the, the army using camels, we have a question of, did they fight while sitting on a camel? The U.S. Army did not. No, the U.S. Army uh, uh, did not fight while sitting on the camels. In the United States, these were just for, uh, for uh, uh, moving products. They were pack animals. Um, and in fact, in, the, in the, the Camel Corps, they didn't ride them very much at all. They were much more pack animals. But if we go back to the Middle East, uh, there have been several instances throughout history where there were actually camel cores. There were, there were instances of uh, uh, cultures in the Middle East using camels in war, and they would fight with swords and lances from the backs of camels. Yes. All right, we have a question for everybody, so we'll rotate through. Uh, I'll answer first. So have you ever ridden a camel? Yes, I have. Uh, there were camels at a recent zoo we went to. So we rode a camel at the zoo. How about you, Darren? I have not ridden a camel. One, I have never gotten the opportunity. And two, I'm a big guy. I think I would need Titanotilopus to, to ride. I don't think I could fit on, on a, I don't think a modern camel would do very well with, with six foot five, 300 pounds of me on its back. So they'd get even more ornery. Jeff? I have not, but it's been on my bucket list. It's something I've always wanted to do. Uh, ornery or not, I, I, it's something I, I think it would be a lot of fun. And I don't know if I'd want to do a back train or a dromedary, but I would think a back train would be a little easier because you can, you know, maybe sit between those two humps. I, I don't know. I think, I think it sounds like fun. They do have a really weird gait. It feels really weird. How about you, Clint? I have not, and I have no desire to be within reaching distance of a camel. So um, I'm just going to leave it at that. What's your favorite dinosaur? What's my favorite dinosaur? Uh, my favorite dinosaur is probably Brachiosaurus. Uh, I actually did my master's thesis on dinosaurs. I studied sauropod dinosaurs, the long neck plant eating uh, dinosaurs for my, uh, for my master's thesis. And uh, um, so I like... Uh, I like sauropods and when asked why it's always because well sauropods were huge they were too big to be bothered by anyone and they pretty much just hung out and ate just like me so that pretty much describes me to a t so, yeah. yep. i was gonna say they're nice and tall like you exactly yep. <laughs> exactly all uh, right can I, can I chime in with one question might be a little technical for some of the other viewers but uh just because we're on the subject mm -hmm. So what is the comparison, Darren, between um, Titana, what was it, Titanotilopus, mm -hmm. Megatilopus, and do we have evidence that maybe they were interacting? Uh, I think they were both alive at the same time and maybe interacted biogeographically? I, I don't know. Yeah, and so that time period, like the Pliocene, was the time period of like big camels. Um, uh, and we really recognize three big camels. We've got Titanotilopus, Megatilopus, and this third thing called uh, uh, Gigantocamelus, I think, all right? There's a lot of debate as to are they indeed three different things or, or, or uh, are they, uh, are they uh, um, you know, are they all technically the same, the same type of thing? And I don't think everyone, anyone has really addressed that appropriately uh, because again, that involves uh, going and doing boring taxonomy that, uh, that, you know, no one really likes to do and no one cares about camels anyway. So I'm the only one in the world I think who cares about camels in terms of paleontology. So they're not a popular group. So yeah. Yep. My sense is that I doubt there were three giant camels living alongside each other. So that just doesn't make a lot of sense. I think we're probably just, you know, finding a male versus a female here and 
we've just named them two different things because they have very different uh, skeletal features. So yeah, yep. But were they were they indeed three different taxa? Yes, there would have been three. Um, they would have certainly lived at the same time period. I'm not certain about the biogeography. Um, if we find like one in the Midwest or one uh, one uh, um, out in like the West Coast or something, I'm not certain. The, the Pliocene camels aren't really my specialty. I was much more back in the Miocene. If I remember correctly, what you're describing, Titanotylopus, is more northern. And yep. from what I understand, that Megatylopus was primarily, you know, Hempelian and, you know, down in Oklahoma, Texas. That that, that makes sense. Maybe they didn't even interact. They might not have, yeah. Yeah. Yep. First, I have a quick question for Darren. Oh, okay. Um, Darren, um, not so much a question as a request. Um, at some point, we should um, take that camel holotype that we reprepared at mines there and describe that new material that we found in the block. Oh yes. The one from uh, big, big Springs Canyon, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Pro Camila's grandis. Yes, we should. We yeah, should for, be. for, uh, Jeff and, and Becky, yep. <clears throat> uh, Mindy was doing some repair work on the holotype and part of what was with it, there was a couple bones that were in a big block of rock. And so while we were doing the work, it was kind of like, well, why don't we just keep prepping that block of rock? And there ended up being a whole nother set of bones in the block that were never seen before, including, I think the sacrum was in there as well. Um, so just something at some point we should maybe follow up on is um, get that new material described that might help out with some of the camel stuff. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that thing is pro Camillus. Pro Camillus is going to be the, uh, the ancestor of all these big, camels like like this 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 guy that you this fella that you see here that is a uh, arboreal camel so yeah so <laughs> that would begin to uh begin to address some of those questions because yeah those pliocene camels are kind of a mess and they could use some they could use a little attention so, all right so moving on to tomorrow again thank you darren this was great um i really Absolutely. enjoyed the talk thanks for joining us uh tomorrow we will be talking with dr holly woodward uh, from Oklahoma State University, and she is going to talk to us about bone histology. So some of our guest speakers have talked about, you know, taking bones from various animals. Mostly we've talked about dinosaurs and cutting very thin sections out of them and looking at them under the microscope to look at growth um, and age and things like that. And so Holly is one of the experts at doing that type of work. And so she is going to come and talk to us about the work that she's done. And I know that in particular, one study she's worked on recently has been looking at the histology of tyrannosaurs and learning more about how tyrannosaurs lived and grew. And so uh, maybe she'll talk to us a bit about that and maybe about some other dinosaurs as well. So uh, join us tomorrow, which will be a Wednesday, April 15th, uh, 10 a.m. Central Time, and we'll talk all about bone histology. And so thanks for joining us today, and we hope to see you all tomorrow.